Hello and welcome to WVU Medicine Tuesday Talks. I'm your host, Mary Ravazio Menard. An estimated 600,000 individuals in the U.S. have been diagnosed with a craniofacial condition. Craniofacial anomalies or disorders are malformations of the face and skull that may result from a birth defect, disease, or trauma. What exactly causes craniofacial anomalies and how are they treated? We'll answer those questions and more as today we're talking with Dr. Hal Meltzer, Chief of WVU Medicine Children's Pediatric Neurosurgery and part of the expert team at the WVU Medicine, uh, I wanna get this right, at the WVU Medicine Children's Cleft and Craniofacial Center. Welcome Dr. Meltzer to Tuesday Talks. Thank you, Mary. That was a great introduction. Oh, thank you. It's great <laughs> you to have it, you, you here. You got it perfect. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> Doing something right here today. If you have any pediatric craniofacial surgery questions, just submit them in the comments section below and we'll try to answer them live. All right. Well, let's get started. I'm so glad you're here. Um, let's first talk about we talked a little bit in the intro about what exactly is a uh, craniofacial anomaly. Um, what do you find to be the most common craniofacial anomaly? Well, uh, Mary, the most common one that I'm involved with treating is called craniosynostosis. And that actually is not that uncommon. It's about one in 2,000 live births. Wow. So um, we see kids uh, with this diagnosis or potential to have this diagnosis uh, quite frequently. Um, and the causes can be varied. We think that most of the time it's from just the way the baby's head could be shaped or positioned before being born. Wow. And so um, it happens more frequently uh, in first time mothers, for example. Hmm. And so if there's a restriction uh, in, the, in the area for growth um, before you're born, that can potentially cause this to happen. More rarely, it can be a genetic type of disorder that runs in the families, and that's about one in 20,000 births, so about 10 times as rare. Uh, but those cases can be much more complicated. Hmm. Are, there, are there any um, mothers that would, be, are there any risk factors where you may be more likely to have a child with a craniofacial anomaly? Potentially, um, like for example, certain metabolic disorders uh, that, uh, that a mom could have uh, or the baby could have um, could potentially be involved with it. Um, as I mentioned before, there are some um, diagnoses that run in the family. Mm -hmm. So um, some people know about that ahead of time or they know that it potentially at risk, like the mom or the dad could have craniosynostosis yeah. and it get passed on. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes not having a lot of room can be involved with it. So if you have like twins, let's say for example, oh. or triplets where there's, not, where there's not a lot of room, yeah. uh, it's possible uh, that, um, that it could be involved. So, um, and a lot of times though, we don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just happens sometimes. But the good news, Mary, is that these kind of conditions are really easily treated now with the uh, modern type of treatments and techniques we have here at, at WVU Medicine Children's. So it's a kind of a diagnosis where if it happens, that is something that we could say, okay, you know what, we've got this, but it's gonna be fixable, and we're gonna have a great life together afterward. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the good news. Are most craniofacial anomalies fixable? Oh, absolutely, as far as the appearance and things like that. Now, sometimes there's, as I mentioned, there's genetic issues. There could be multiple conditions, like for example, water on the brain or hydrocephalus can be evolved mm -hmm. um, for genetic craniosynostosis. Also things like Chiari malformation. So if there's a genetic issue, then it's much more complicated. But still, most of the conditions, if we know about them, we can fix one way or the other. Great. So how do you go about diagnosing these? Is there like a general screening when your child is born or? <laughs> well, there always is. And so sometimes if it's severe enough, then it can be um, discovered um, when, you're, when your child is born or part of the what they call a normal newborn examination. But the thing, the kind of take home message though, Mary, about craniosynostosis versus just your head may look a little unusual because of just being born, is that craniosynostosis always looks more severe and is more noticeable the older you get. Uh -huh. So um, typically there's a schedule for kids to go back for checkups, like uh, a week and then a month and then two months and then four months. And so typically 
it starts to become more and more noticeable mm. as, as time goes on. And that's one of the kind of the keys to um, craniosynostosis is the older you get, the more and more noticeable it becomes. Um, so that that's, I gotta say this right, craniosynostosis. Uh, Was better, that close? That's better mm. than I can say. It. All right, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> are, are there other common, you know, semi-common, common, other common craniofacial anomalies? besides crane, you know, that you deal with a lot? So um, you mentioned before that there can be sometimes trauma. So if you have things like a complex frontal orbital fracture um, or something that's involving the brain and the face, mm -hmm. um, there can be complications where it needs to be corrected surgically. And those are things that are best done by a craniofacial team. So we kind of mentioned this, or you mentioned it earlier about a team approach. Yeah. So. Um, we want to work with um, craniofacial plastic surgeons as well as neurosurgeons together. And so we have two great ones uh, at WVU Medicine Children's, Dr. Uh, Brooke and Dr. Oigar. So uh, we have a great team. And so we do these surgeries together. And that way, each of us brings uh, the best of our abilities to make sure that the kids get the best care they could possibly receive. That sounds like that's the, the main focus um, at the WVU Medicine Children's Cleft and Craniofacial Center, because you're part of that team, mm -hmm, right? And um, I mean, it's it's a big team, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's uh, it's uh, as part of our craniofacial clinic, uh, we have input from neurodevelopment, um, from uh, psychology, uh, social work is involved, uh, pediatric neurology. So it really is a team approach, and, and that's what you want to do if, you, if you're a family, is you want to make sure, hey, you know, this is the center that has that kind of team approach. And I think in West Virginia, we're the only, uh, we're the only um, uh, accredited center uh, for uh, craniofacial and for cleft lip and palate, which is something that, that my partners I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Brook and Dr. Oigar take care of. But wow. um, uh, these are the kind of things where you want to have a craniofacial team be involved. And you know, I got to tell you Mary, we're, we've we've done so well over the past few years here that um, you know, we not only take care of the kids from West Virginia itself, but we have families driving from all the neighboring states uh, yeah. to get care here too from from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Ohio, uh, Kentucky, Virginia. So we're really becoming known now as a center of excellence, which which is where we we want to be and where the families of of West Virginia deserve deserve to have. I always like to say, it's right here in our front yard. It's not in our backyard. <laughs> it's right here in the front yard. I mean, you don't have to leave the state for this kind of care, right? Oh, it's uh, not only that. As I mentioned, we have people coming from all the neighboring states uh, uh, as well. So what is, what is your role on the team at uh, children, the WV Medicine Children's Cleft and Craniofacial Center? So as the pediatric neurosurgeon, my job is primarily to what I would say play defense. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's say the, uh, the plastic surgeons, right? They want you to look as good as you can possibly look. They want to make sure that when we're finished, no one would ever know that anything was ever done, that you're just like everybody else. But to get to that point, I have to make sure that we don't have any issues with the brain because mm -hmm. that's right where we have to work. We don't want any problems with, let's say, leaking of brain fluid, mm -hmm. bleeding, damage to the brain. So my job is to play defense. I make sure that all those areas are very well protected. I'm the person who actually has to remove the skull bones, which mm -hmm. we remove as part of the treatment. So the uh, Dr. Brooke and Dr. Oigar can reshape them. So uh, that's where I kind of fit in. I, I make sure that things are done in, in the safest and, and best way possible. Wow. That's great. We're lucky to have you here, you know. <laughs> um, so what are some of the very latest procedures uh, you use at the Cleft and Craniofacial Center? Well, we're doing things on both ends of the spectrum. So by that, what I mean is that on the minimally invasive front, we uh, have minimal invasive procedures where we use a special kind of endoscope to minimize the cuts as much as possible. Uh, we implant springs during the surgery through these minimal incisions to help reshape the skull. And then we leave those in for about three months after surgery. 
and then uh, we can do a very minor uh, like an outpatient procedure to remove them uh, at oh, the wow. end of that. So that's been a new technique that we've really been leading the way on and here. And that's all done brain surgery minimally invasively. I mean, that just... <laughs> Absolutely. It kind, of, it kind of blows your mind, huh? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> so, so we have that end of the spectrum, right? But on the other end, for those kids that I talked about uh, earlier that have these genetic kind of problems that are, that are more involved, then uh, we, or kids are a little bit older or a different kind of diagnosis, we have uh, a more kind of traditional approach where we do a larger incision and have to remove large pieces of the skull and reshape the forehead. And so in those procedures, we can also implant distractors uh, that uh, help to move the skull bones apart. And uh, those are, are really a great advance because we get the most expansion of the skull possible in the safest way. So those kids can have issues where the skull is so malformed that it can't grow. Oh and, my gosh. And so what happens is that impairs brain development. And so if, if, if we don't do a surgery to correct it, the kids can have visual loss, even mm -hmm. blindness, or severe developmental delay that could be permanent. So in those cases, we want to partner with, with our plastic and craniofacial surgeons and expand the skull as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And the safest and best way to do that with the most volume is to implant a distractor or one or more into the skull. And then we um, teach the families to actually um, turn them and expand them a little bit every day. And so wow. that's where we partner with the families and where education is really important. So we also have a great team. We have an amazing craniofacial uh, advanced practitioner, Michelle Vitalich, and so she does a great job with helping to educate the families and, and teach them to partner with us. And so that's the way that we can really use the most advanced, you know, really world-class treatments uh, oh, to, yeah. to take care of kids. And, and so it's great to be able to do that here in West Virginia uh, for our families. Tell me about the bloodless surgery protocol that you have. I mean, that sounds, what the heck is bloodless surgery protocol? <laughs> How can you have surgery without blood? <laughs> so that's actually something that, that we're actually leading the way on here. And so um, I'm used to uh, kind of thinking about so-called bloodless surgery, which means a surgery or an operation that typically would need to have a blood transfusion, mm. that you try to do everything possible to avoid doing that. Now, the blood is safe, it's tested for everything, yeah. but in children, you could still have like adverse reactions to blood, oh. like certain kind of allergic reactions or even difficulty with breathing and certain kids have, we don't know necessarily who those kids might be, so wow. if you could avoid doing a transfusion in a child, it's optimal. So in this um, area, we partnered with our anesthesia colleagues. So we have a great director of perioperative services, Dr. Pavi, uh, Pavi Ellison, and so we partner with her and her team in crafting a protocol to minimize as much as possible the chance of needing to transfuse uh, blood during surgery. And we also have a fantastic head of, of hematology, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Tom Bach, and so we work with him with certain pharmaceuticals that can actually raise your blood up before surgery. Wow. So with his direction, we instruct the families to give certain medications that can help raise up the child's blood level before surgery. And that way we have more of a cushion during the operation to be able to lose some blood but not have to do a transfusion. Wow. And then there's also medications that the anesthesiologist can, can give during surgery mm -hmm. that can help prevent excessive bleeding. And then the techniques that we do as surgeons during the operation, we maximize uh, that, those as well. So um, right now we're offering families 90% or more chance of no transfusion whatsoever wow. with these surgeries, which I would say that for most of these surgeries that are done throughout the country or throughout the world, it's more the other way around. The chance of needing a transfusion is, is 90%. Wow. So we've absolutely flipped the script here and we've we presented this data at our national meetings and we're putting together scientific papers to talk about it. So this is something that really is, is only being done here at, at WVU Medicine Children. So I'm glad you asked that question because that's something that we're all really proud about. And that also yeah. shows you the team approach where you're working with, with different specialists that all have areas of expertise. And so that's the advantage of when you can work together is you could do things that no one could do by themselves right. and all for the benefit of the patient and the families. Wow. That's really amazing. That's really amazing. So 
Before we leave here then, what's the most important thing you want our viewers to know about craniofacial anomalies and craniofacial surgery? Besides all that spectacular <laughs> stuff you just told us. <laughs> well, I, I would like people to know that obviously these are um, diagnoses that when you get them, they can be very scary. Yeah. And it's something that people are going to think about, are going to worry about. But we want to reassure people, you know, this is like anything else that you could be born with that you're more used to hearing about. All oh, the tonsils have to be taken out, this or that. We want people to approach this the same way. Yes, it's going to be a procedure. We're going to have to do something to fix this, but it's completely fixable. We would have an expectation of an absolutely normal life afterward. It's something that we have to go through together, but we should anticipate it being completely corrected and that this is the best place that you could be. So there's, there's really no need to go anywhere else. In West Virginia, you could be taken care of here, and it's exactly the opposite in that best place for other people to come to to be taken care of as well. This is world-class medicine, a world-class surgery, and a world-class team. So that's the take-home message I would like to say to the viewers today. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us. It was really interesting. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Tuesday Talks. If you're looking for more information about craniofacial anomalies and other pediatric neurosurgery conditions, visit wvukids.com. And join us on Tuesday Talks on August 22nd when we'll talk about social media and mental health with Dr. Jonathan Pearl, a clinical psychologist with the WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. I'm Mary Ravazio Menard, and on behalf of Dr. Meltzer and everyone at WVU Medicine, thanks for joining us and have a great day.